There goes the neighborhood. <laughs> If you drive a few miles down a dirt road behind the Mount Crested Butte Ski Resort in Colorado, you'll find an old ghost town called Gothic. Today, this collection of wood cabins is home to the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory and some of the world's most unique ecological research. Gizmodo recently visited the lab and talked to scientists. Some of them are leading studies that have been going on for several decades. I'm Dan Blumstein, I'm a behavioral ecologist, and I study marmots and run the long-term marmot project at the Rock Mountain Biological Laboratory. Yellow-bellied marmots are somewhat unique. They live in groups, but they don't have to live in groups. I describe them as being facultatively social or, or socially plastic. That gives us an opportunity in one species to say, well, what are the benefits and costs of living with others? So by listening to my inner marmot, by understanding what's going on with marmots, maybe we're getting some insights that are providing questions we can ask even about human health. We're gonna be going to Marmot Meadow, which is one of our long-term persistent sites. Marmots are harem polygynous in that males have one or more wives, partners, and that you have females, and they're matrilineal in the sense that females allow some of their daughters, or may allow some of their daughters to stick around. This is our picnic colony, consistently occupied for at least 57 years. The same way that um, people have looked at uh, social relationships and social networks using Facebook contacts, we're doing a lot of studies looking at social relationships using social network statistics. By spending a lot of time out here, about a thousand hours a year, we can begin to piece together these relationships and look at the consequences of these relationships. So it looks like we caught a marmot over here. Let me tell you about what we do. We trap these animals and we give them permanent ear tags and mark them. And we paint marks on their back so we can identify them from a distance um, and observe their behavior. We collect a bunch of samples, we collect feces, we collect hair. From the fecal samples, we're able to get a variety of hormones and understand what hormone levels are. We look for stress hormones, we can look for growth-related hormones. So we're measuring the left hind foot, uh, and it's a way for us to have an idea of their skeletal size. This is a yearling female. Okay, we're gonna weigh it. If you're a female marmot raised in a litter of males, you're likely to be a little more masculinized. So Julian's gonna release this one right where we caught it, and uh, it's gonna run back into its burrow. Bye. Part of what makes the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab so special is the place itself. Almost 150 years ago, miners started digging at the foot of Gothic Mountain and built a town that they named after the nearby peak. After the discovery of silver there in the 1880s, the miners flocked to the town by the thousands. But the value of silver eventually dropped and the miners abandoned the town. Drawn by the area's idyllic beauty and rich ecology, however, more and more scientists started doing fieldwork near the ghost town. Then, in 1928, a few of them moved into the old buildings and established the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. David Inouye is another scientist who's been working at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab for decades. He studies flowers and hummingbird populations from his cabin near Gothic Mountain, and he's also inspiring a new generation of ecologists. This has been a great place for, for my research career, and it's also a very family-friendly place. One of my sons is now a professional ecologist at Florida State University, met his wife out here. So now we've got uh, another generation of ecologists out here at the Biological Lab. I have banded thousands of hummingbirds here. So the way we keep track of individual hummingbirds is by banding them, and that allows us to estimate both the population size in a given summer, as well as uh, over the years. There's the male, he's got that pit tag glued on his back. Cassie, who's working in the shack down there, has an antenna. When the bird flies through the antenna, she can tell which individual bird it is. My name is Mary Caswell Stoddard. I work on bird coloration and bird perception. And birds are especially interesting in this respect because they have ultraviolet vision. They have a fourth color cone compared to our three human color cones that allow them to see a whole extra dimension of color perception. And so to track individual hummingbirds, we use something called a pit tag. So this little pit tag is a backpack. And a hummingbird wearing such a backpack can come to our experiment or to a feeder, and when the pit tag goes through one of our special antennas, the antenna will read and record a unique number associated with this tag. So this is 
a male, male broad-tailed hummingbird. You can see his iridescent gorget. So this would be one that I banded, uh, I think, two years ago. I'd have to check my records for that. I'm going to give him a drink. I'll often take a drink from the feeder while you're holding him. See a little bit of his tongue sticking out. This one's a bit of a squirmer, so he's probably going to take off right away. There he goes. It seems like you can't talk to anyone at the lab without hearing the name Billy Barr. Billy moved to the Gothic area in 1972, and while living alone in a shack, started collecting environmental data out of boredom. Billy has been living off the grid ever since. Well, I got to this area in 1972. In 1979, I bought some land in the town site of Gothic. I just started recording things I saw, which was daily low, daily high, new snow, water content of the new snow, and snow depth. Then I just kept it going. And for no reason at all, it wasn't like I was necessarily trying to find anything out other than my own curiosity of how does this winter compare to the last 15 years or the last 20 years or whatever. And then around 1990, a researcher at the lab found out I had this and he started using it in conjunction with his plant phenology, that's David Inouye. Sort of a motley crew of solar panels down here. What is all this hooked up to? Is this to, just to power your home? Yeah, uh, the reason it's motley looking is I didn't start until 1980. The first eight years I had a kerosene lamp and battery powered radio and that was it. And so what's changed a lot for me in terms of entertainment is I watch movies every night and then the internet. I mean, I'm on it all the time. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. There's a lot of snow. It's hard to deal with a lot and winters are long and go on forever. Something extraordinary is happening at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And what's even more extraordinary is the fact that it's been happening for so long. Researchers are doing long-term studies unlike anything the world has ever seen and providing us with a truly unique glimpse at how our planet is so quickly changing. But the small collection of cabins at the foot of Gothic Mountain is also doing what it's always done. It's bringing people together. Only this time, it's not for silver, it's for science.